oh, hello, I didn't see you there. My name is Abe Hunter, and I'm the founder of the Lead Society, and I'm here with my trusty co-host, Richard Olarsaba. Richard, how are you? Good, good, good. I'm really excited for this show. I've been looking forward to this ever since you were able to secure the one and only Michelle Can. <laughs> Con. <laughs> Michelle can, but con if you if you want to be fancy. Well, I, yeah. and I am very fancy. Um, Michelle, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, and thank you so much for having me. That's the sound of our live studio audience who chimes in sometimes. So um. <laughs> glad to know. Um, are you joining us from sunny um, uh, Philadelphia? I am not joining you from snowy Philadelphia right oh. now, but <laughs> it's better a better term for it at the moment. But I am actually in Miami, Miami Beach, Florida right now. <laughs> oh my god! About to record with uh, the new with members of the New World Symphony, so I'm down here for the week. How fabulous! I mean, that makes for anyone who knows geography, like where I live in Pembroke Pines, like it's just. I would say it's a 30 minute drive, but with traffic, it's about an hour. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so we're close. This is actually the closest Michelle and I have been in a couple years since the last time I was in Philadelphia and we yes. got to hang out. <laughs> Which was fun. <laughs> so I, you know, in this, when it comes to the show, Michelle, um, we usually are able to start things off with introductions, who you are and everything, but I thought it would be best if we just let you speak for yourself and we have a clip of you and I think it's very appropriate just to give people an idea. Um, this is uh, the Chopin, um, what is it? Chopin A210 number eight? Mm -hmm. yes. One of the easier yeah. ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, without further ado, by the way, I've been salivating over this recording, um, but enough, we'll let it speak for itself. Here we go. Hold on. <laughs> now, can you teach me how to make to do the le leggero? I mean, that is just—I've never—that's just stunning. 
It, it was um, more, a, it was the special piano that I was using actually. So people don't know that, but that that's what you were really getting. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where can I buy one? <laughs> <laughs> Made it much easier now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. The other key I would say is for Chopin etudes in general is for you to like once you've spent however long learning any of the Chopin piano etudes, as soon as you get it at its best, go to a recording studio and record it. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't wait any longer <laughs> because you leave it alone for a little while and then you go back to it. In other words, don't ask me to do this live right now or it won't be, it, we're just being honest here. <laughs> <laughs> Or, like you said, you just need to cart that piano around everywhere you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, pull, pull a Horowitz and travel everywhere you go with your own Steinway. There we go. Future goals. <laughs> so, Michelle, it is so amazing to have you on the show, not because of just, like, your prodigious talent and, like, amazing musicianship, but also because you and I go way back. Um, we were both at the Cleveland Institute of Music together. Uh, started out at the same time. And that was a, a, Do we want people to know our age? Are we going to say which year that was? To, oh, hey, I, mean, guys, I have nothing against that. Guys, by the way, um, um, someone you may know, Dean Southern, says hello. He's watching. Oh, yes. well, hello. <laughs> oh, great. Now I have to be careful what I say. No, oh, no not no. at all. Please. He was, he was on the show as a guest and he was able to speak freely as well. So we give everyone that. <laughs> yep. We, we encourage people to let it rip. No one, no one really even watches this. So. <laughs> But um, like I said, like amazing to have you here uh, just for people to know, um, not only are you an amazing performer, collaborator, but um, you are the Eleanor Sokoloff Chair in Piano Studies at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Um, wow. <laughs> like, I mean, not to put a finer point on it, but what an accomplishment at, I'll say it, at our age. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but like really like what what does that feel like being a contemporary of of your own teachers even um i mean i'm i was definitely floored when i was asked uh to join the faculty in this particular position i actually didn't know when i was first asked i didn't know that it would be a chaired position and it became possible for that to be because as you know a chaired position comes with a big donation of some kind and you know uh basically to make that happen so someone really wanted to have which is a beautiful thing to have this chair in honor of eleanor sokoloff who uh hopefully i'm getting these numbers exactly right but i'm pretty sure she passed away this past summer at 106 years old. So absolute amazing. And let me tell you, up until the end, I, she was completely with it. Beautiful lady. She would come um, and her, I guess I would say her most famous role by the end of uh, her tenure at Curtis was being the, the lady who serves the tea to everyone during our Wednesday teas. This is a tradition that Curtis has had for, I guess, since it was founded, basically, which is Wednesday afternoon tea time. And, you know, it's just this, like very, um, basically, it's a social hour in a lot of ways where the school will all come together. But she is the one that sits there with the big teapot, basically, and serves um, the tea to everyone and strikes up conversations. You always see, like, her, you know, posse basically around her as, <laughs> as, as she would you know, be telling stories. I mean, everyone loved her. And of course she was an amazing teacher. I mean, she, she was at Curtis pretty much right after she graduated. So it's 80 something years that she taught there. So, um, yeah, so I plan on, so if anyone from Curtis is listening, yeah, I'll be there for like 80 something years. So yeah, we're going <laughs> to do well, I guess, okay. I mean, the, the big question is, since you do have the chair position in her honor, do you have to pour the tea now? You said what? Do I? Yeah. <laughs> Does that fall on you now? <laughs> or is that a seniority thing? Like you got to, you know, when you're 84, you can start. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> First, I've got to do a little bit of research on when this started, but trust me, I have been asked to, to, to you know, TBD on this. Uh, first, I can't wait until Curtis can finally be back in person. We're all virtual right now. So um, at any rate, it's, you know, we'll see. But at any rate, in, in all seriousness, absolutely um, just a huge honor. Uh, it was pretty, it was actually really funny. I'll tell you how uh, I found out. So Curtis is, I guess, unique. Some schools will do this, but they're unique in the sense that you cannot apply to be a professor at Curtis. Um, it's just not really the way they do it. They invite people to fill faculty positions. And um, obviously there is different criteria that's involved in figuring out who that's going to be. But a lot of the time, and in my case, it is done like secretly in a lot of ways, like without your full knowledge. So in my case, um, apparently the president and those uh, up on top were I was on a short list of people that they were considering to come in and, and step in after Eleanor had passed away. And they were calling my, you know, my teacher from when I was a Curtis student and calling all, a lot of people and asking them very honestly if they thought I would be the right person. So they for those who are pulp. listening, if you are students, treat your teachers well. You <laughs> never know <laughs> when they will be called to speak on your behalf and, you know, so treat them well and show them, you know, the respect and such things. Because I mean, and it's not just your teachers. Quite honestly, I think a big lesson, which I try to share with my students and anyone I can, is that from when we started college and really before, but especially when you start college and moving forward, every connection you make matters. For instance, Richard, if you didn't really like me, I don't think I'd be on this show. Like, let's just be honest here. Okay, so, you know, if we couldn't work together, you would not be calling Michelle Kahn. <laughs> So, <laughs> and so at any rate, I mean, that's just an example that I'm trying to make here that just in life in general, but if we're speaking about the music world, it's really important to treat people well, you know, leave on a good note, you know, when you collaborate with people, um, take it seriously and all these things, because you honestly never know when that's going to work in your favor. So anyway, in this case, I feel like that was a big, big part of it because I wasn't fully aware that this was happening. And then I was asked to come in on a Zoom meeting with the president and the dean. And I was you know, curious. I said, well, there's only one of two things going on here. Either I'm in trouble and I'm getting fired from the position that I currently have at Curtis, or it's a good thing. You know, there's no other reason to have this private meeting with the president. But, um, you know, it when they, what I love is they started the conversation. They were, you know, just making small talk. They're just like, yeah, so how have things been going? And, um, oh, I love your cat. Your cat's real cute. Okay, hey, do you want to be a professor at Curtis? <laughs> That's literally how it went. Just I mean, Easing, easing you in. <laughs> totally eased me in. And the best part was that when they said it, obviously we went into more detail after that. Literally, I just walked away. Like I just left the screen and just went over there. And then I came back and then I said, are you serious? <laughs> they were like, this would be a really horrible joke if it wasn't. <laughs> Like, because, I'm you know, not really I, the to president. To give you guys a really honest reaction here, that's what happens. <laughs> yes. Well, and, you know, to your point when you're talking about, like, just making good connections and making good impressions, um, this is actually from, I mean, this is for the audience, but this is from your bio on the Curtis website. Oh, yeah. This is an account from your, your you know, your former teacher, now colleague, saying, Michelle is a wonderful example of what it means to be a vital, fully engaged citizen of our profession and, as such, a role model for aspiring pianists to both admire and emulate. I mean, what a an endorsement from your your own teacher, like to actually, you know, say how much you've contributed to, um, you know, just your community and everything. I, I love how it's put for a lot of the, the faculty at um, Curtis, it's your artist citizens. And um, you and I had talked uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, and you'd mentioned that since your time at Curtis, even when you were a student there, and even after in this time before you know taking on this position, that you were actually very involved in the community. 
Mm-hmm. And like, so, I mean, and I, and I know that contributed a lot to your getting the position. Let's just say it, let's yeah. just call it facts, facts. But right, so, exactly. and I guess the question is COVID aside and everything, what were you doing before uh, coming on as faculty at Curtis? And like, are you still going to be able to, to do, to sustain both? Right, right. No, so that's such a good thank you for um, segueing there. So to connect that to the um, Curtis position, when I stopped like running away from the camera because I just couldn't <laughs> see what was happening and I finally stayed there, we talked and they basically went into the reasons that they really wanted me to come in as faculty. And they said, the thing is that as the world is changing, you know, in general, like beyond music, but especially everyone is seeing, I think COVID really woke a lot of people up too, right? In 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 even more ways. But our entire industry is changing. And I think classical music, we have typically been the farthest behind, right? In terms of embracing change. And um, one of the things that they were saying is that, and this is very true, that Curtis, although they have some great traditions, I mean, definitely it's a competitive school, right? They put out some of the best pianists. Um, my experience there, Robert McDonald, my teacher, was you know, is an amazing teacher. So of course, Curtis does certain things very well, and they always have, but they've been stuck in certain ways in a very narrow focus. And then as the world changes, it's like, well, how can we, like, we have a responsibility to our students to equip them properly for a career and and a career right now, not a career 50 years ago, what that used to look like. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, they were bringing up, you know, what they were happy about and what really made them consider me was how active I was in various ways. In other words, I was already striving to be more, even though I love it, but more than just a soloist. And um, so, you know, some stuff I was doing before, I mean, I've always been collaborating, right? I mean, that was a big thing for us. Just like, I loved playing with you. And you know, of course, your wonderful voice, but ever since we were you know, younger in college, just being able to play in your lessons. And as you know, I'd play for many of our classmates and many different instruments. So I just loved collaborating with other musicians. Um, Definitely that's connected to my background as my father is a band director and choir director and such. So I played so many instruments, okay, from trombone to at one point, the tuba, I played violin, not, you know, not so great these days, but I was doing that pretty pretty much right under the piano. Um, and so, you know, when you come from that kind of a background, then you want to still involve yourself with as many instruments as possible, right? So I always did that. Um, when it came to, um, when I came to Curtis, I got this great opportunity to join on the faculty of Play On Philly, which is an Elsa Stemma inspired organization. There's a lot of those that have popped up around America now based on that Elsa Stemma program that started in Venezuela. So um, Stanford Thompson, great um, leader to this program and and many other things, but he had just started this program when I moved to Philadelphia. They needed a choir director, never had done children's choir before, but I said, I'm just going to do this. And it really changed (laughs) my perspective. God God bless you. What do you mean by that? I, I've worked. It's I, a I, church I, choir, I, Michelle. Worked, <laughs> I've worked in a, many, many a church churches, and the children's yes. choir has always frightened me. <laughs> well, I frightened them. <laughs> I had a pretty good, yeah, I had a pretty good fist in that in that class. One time, listen, I was all about discipline. If you were going to get the music to, to, you know, and get these performances to be right, then everyone had to act right. I remember one time we were getting ready for a performance that the mayor would be at. So, you know, I wasn't playing games. And I said to them, I said to the kids, we were practicing, you know, walking single file into the space and then I would seat you and all this, you know, all that fun stuff. And I remember that some of the kids just kept fooling around. They wouldn't sit down together and this and that. And finally I said, okay, okay, so you guys want to do this? All right, well, I can do this too. For the whole class, 
all we did that day was walk out, then walk back in, then <laughs> sit down, then stand up, then walk back. I think I did about 30 minutes of that. And I said, if you say one word, we're starting this over. And I said, and I can keep you after, it's fine. Like, <laughs> I'm just saying. So, that's that side. <laughs> Uh oh, let me not go too deep into this. But this is the reality of teaching sometimes too, and that we all know. But I got the respect from the kids. I mean, quite honestly, their performances were just amazing. They always made me smile so much. I love these kids. So doing this program really got me thinking about what it means to be involved in your community, you know, near you. Beyond those one off, oh, I played at the nursing home. Oh, I played for an outreach at the school. Uh, now I'm done. You know, what does it mean to actually somewhat, you know, find ways to immerse yourself into, you know, these children's lives in a way that can really be meaningful. So I continued uh, after I finished with Play on Philly, I started my own program called Keys to Connect, which was a program that was tailored towards parents and their children, one parent and children taking piano together at the same time in a group class. And the whole point was to find ways, in my mind, it was like, okay, I want you to connect with your child on a level that's different than the usual day by day stuff, which is go do your homework. Let's watch a show. Let's go to the mall. Like, you know, how can we do something where it's not just parents telling their children what to do, but then the parent is like actively involved in a really good activity. You know, so music is huge. And so it was really great. This process was, um, I learned a lot in the families I worked with. Um, I just felt like there was a lot of growth um, and they just had fun. So this was something really great. I got to do that. Then I actually transitioned to a peer mentorship because I went to a school in West Philly that I couldn't do it after school. And so I thought, well, how can I alter this? And so instead I involved eighth graders who took a class group class with me and then first graders would come in on a one-on-one -on -one mentorship mm -hmm. and they would teach their first grader you know again all in a group format and then we'd have this concert at the end which again was really awesome and i just made such i i literally ran into and i still remember this um i have i'm not doing that program right now but my first group of kids um i ran into one of them, which is hilarious. I guess she just finished graduating from high school, was getting ready to start college, and it was like summer of COVID. And I'm literally like driving through a Wendy's drive through And she's like, I'm just being honest. And then she's like, she's about to take my car. She's like, Miss Michelle? Because they would call me Miss Michelle. And I'm like, who is calling me Miss Michelle at a Wendy's drive through right now? And it was... <laughs> And it turns out, so she's like, this is the student of mine. I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't seen you in so long. And I'm sitting there holding up the line. People are ready to hop. <laughs> I'm like, can you hold on? Okay, we're having a reunion here. So, but they know, want their spicy nuggets, Michelle. No, I, I, Michelle, I, I, I'm going I'm to ask you the hard-hitting question. Did you get a spicy chicken sandwich? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, no judgment. It's it's one of the best things on the menu. It's my guilty pleasure. <laughs> but the point being, what, what was really fun about it was we were quickly talking and, you know, she's just telling me, yeah, I'm doing this for the summer right now. And, you know, I graduated, you know, with great grades. I'm about to go off to this college. And I'm like, this is beyond awesome. Because she was an eighth grader then. So, you know, um, just these moments where I'm randomly at a Wendy's in Philly somewhere and then I see this student that remembers me and is like so excited to see me. Just even though that's a little hilarious, but the point is that you make these connections and they do last. And so um, here we are at Curtis. And so your question is, okay, that's what I did. Um, am I gonna be able to continue doing this? Well, if I'm involved anywhere and I have the resources, the answer is yes, I have to do something. So right now I'm actually in talks um, with the Dean about, um, and, and some of it's already happening and, the, and they're totally on board, they're very excited. But what I would hoping to um, bring to the piano department at Curtis, which has never been there before, is a pedagogy side of, and I wanna say more than just, okay, it's not just a typical pedagogy class, it's really about, again, getting the Curtis piano students to 
connect with kids and give them lessons. So again, my whole peer mentorship thing, but this is different. Um, I want to select very, like through a process of interviews, I want to select the right families with the right kids that need it in Philly. And then I will pair them up with appropriate Curtis piano students and they're going to get private lessons and we're going to keep these kids in there even if the Curtis piano student changes they're going to keep getting those lessons my whole goal is you know listen I'm trying to get a whole bunch of these beautiful black children into Curtis so we're yeah. starting now <laughs> hold on we're going to start it now <laughs> I mean, Michelle, I'm, I don't know if you can hear it, but our studio audience is like, their they're, hands they're are gonna going to be raw crazy. by the end of this. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like that, again, like I, I, I put it out on like the Facebook blast for this show that like I have been constantly impressed by what you've been able to accomplish since we first met, not just through your own talents, but clearly through this fostering of 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 music to the younger generation to then give to the next generation like it's essentially this like pay it forward pay it forward pay it forward and just like let it keep going to you know as Pablo Casal said as we always quoted at CIM you know music will save the world um and we need it right now of, of all of all times but I mean incredible that you not only have been able to accomplish that so far but you still have the vision to continue that and you know fingers crossed like that'll this is one of the best ideas i've heard in a long time so i don't see why anyone would deny that but um <laughs> pivoting real quick to um like you said like you have this like extensive background in music with like the different instruments and everything but when you and i met even though you did have like violin on the side and you were like trying to pursue violin on the side at CIM, which was like really good on you. It was just like, how does she even have the time? But you were a piano major, you were a piano performance major, like to be a soloist and rightly so. But what impressed me and um, Abe and I were talking about this shortly before the show is that I had the audacity to, you know, it's my junior recital and all the singers had to do one and we have a very good uh, supply of staff pianists. And I was like, well, you know, this is like my first time collaborating and like really being able to like construct a recital and everything. I would really like to have like that full experience. And, you know, like I said, I had the audacity to be like, Michelle, I know you're a solo pianist, but do you want to play my recital? <laughs> but but the, the truth is, and I say this to everybody. Actually, I told wait, them, I need to send you a bill for that. I, I um, <laughs> you were a student. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep going. No, no but like I, I tell everybody this, like when it comes to that particular recital, um, as ambitious as it was, as lengthy as it was for a junior recital, I constantly look back on it as one of the most enriching experiences that I had in collaborating with another pianist because you and I were in that practice room going through every single piece, taking it apart, actually discovering things together because you had, you know, had played for a lot of people and up to that point, but to actually go through the process step by step, I think for one, thank you for the patience and like the, the curiosity to do it. But to have the background as a soloist and to not only have the interest, but like the skill to collaborate that it's not, it's not a unique quality. I mean, it's very special, but let's, let's face it. Like some people choose the path of being a soloist and some people choose the path of being a collaborator and rarely do they ever mix, but you've been able to actually have a very good balance. And how would you say that has like shaped your your own personal artistry and also like what you are going to um, pass on to like these programs fostering the different skills at, for pianists mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no it's a great question i think you know definitely for me the reason i guess behind why i've kept up both it, it starts from just as i said simply really wanting it because i Again, always loved collaborating before I even came to college. Um, my sister's a pianist. We would play together. You know, I think I'm just the reflection of my own personality. You know, I'm the very social butterfly at times. Sometimes I don't really want to talk to anybody. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think that's many people. But, you know, when I have great company, you know, I'm, 
it gives me life and energy, right? So I feel like it it translates into the music. For me, as much as I enjoy playing on my own and there's so much great music, sometimes when you're playing on your own, you know, okay, so you're only feeding off your own energy, right? And your own ideas. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you just need some other inspiration because you you know, you can get a little bit stuck in the way you see things and the way you hear things, right? And so that's actually why I think it is important for people to take opportunities and collaborate more. Here's the number one reason I would say, at least for pianists, that you often see one or the other. It's because a lot of the time we've told ourselves that we don't have the time. It's like, oh no, you know, I have this big solo competition. Oh, I have this big solo recital. And yes, there's a lot of time and hours that can go into preparing, you know, a lot of this rep. And so you're sitting there stressing about making sure you're ready for your next lesson with your piano teacher or whatever else it is. So when somebody asks you, oh, hey, can you uh, play this piece with me and collaborate? Or, oh gosh, the horrible word, accompany me. Oh my goodness. No. <laughs> but no. at any rate, I, I'm fine with it. But you know, the point is that when these things are asked, one or two things happen. You're either going to say, oh, I don't really have the time. I have no time for this, you know? Or you say yes, and then you kind of blow it off. You don't really put the same kind of effort and attention that you would put into it if it was solo rep. And this is a mistake because when you actually take the time and take it seriously, then you're bringing your best self to the table. You collaborate with the right people, they will help shape you too. They are going to inspire you in that moment as you go, which you always did. You know, just the way that you sing compared to other vocalists that I would play with when we were in school, that were a different thing too, but brought something else to the table. But your sound inspired my sound, right? And then that always stuck with me. And that's how it should be. When you collaborate with great people at the same level of yourself, then they are bringing some other element to the table that you are going to carry with you. And it even enhances your solo playing. And so I just think that I always embraced it. And therefore, now that I've got this career, um, I still continue to do both because, not only because I enjoy it, but because I've made those connections and I've always tried to foster them and take them seriously. When people ask me to do a collaborative concert, I want to put everything there. So then what happens is people are going to keep calling you to collaborate with them. Once and they realize you have a... I'm what do you say? Oh, I said once they realize you have a real can-do attitude. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, will you be a professor? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I had to walk away for that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> So anyway, I'll, I'll just mute I've my never audio heard now. that, Abe. <laughs> I mean, that's the title of your book, by the way. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. Um, you know, so no, as I, as I said, I think once again, once people have a good experience with you, they want to continue. That is essentially what I'm saying. And I think that, again, not only because it enhances your own plane, but um, I also think that, and this is something I learned too, and I think you know what I'm talking about, uh, Richard, and, and any of us that are now, we're out of school, we're not students anymore, we're trying to you know, make these careers happen, but we're also trying to pay our bills. So we find that you know, we're busy in many ways, and when you have a concert, that like five, six hours that you were spending when you were a college student to get ready for your senior recital every day um, does not exist. Like, mm -hmm. let's just be honest here, right? So the kind of time that you have as a professional to get ready for these concerts, I mean, it's just like cut in half. You know, you've got to really utilize every minute. And so, but yet we can still do these amazing concerts, right? And we've cut the time in half. So I also say that, you know, there's a lot of musicians and pianists, oh, I need eight hours, I need six, seven hours. And it's like, no, you don't actually. It's how you use that time. 
So even if you practice for three hours and then you spend another two hours collaborating with somebody, trust me, that was good practice because mm. you are going to be shaped. So anyway, this is something, you know, I say, and I actually had a talk with the pianist at Curtis for their first seminar. I was talking to them all and I made a point and I saw them all kind of eyebrows went up like, hmm, she has a point where I said, when you think about being a soloist, right? Say, oh, I just want to be a soloist, you know, and have this big career as, as one would put it. Well, of course, the percentage of people, I'm not going to quote any numbers, but the percentage of musicians that are making their entire living and a good living on just performing, okay? That's very low. I mean, if you can find it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't matter how great you are because there's so many great people in different ways, like we get it. So ultimately, I was saying to some of these pianists, I said, if you're talking about, oh, I just wanna be on the road giving these concerts, say, some of those concerts are gonna be people that wanna collaborate with you. And I said to them, the other side of it is, which has happened to me, when, when a famous violinist calls you to play with them, and they're only gonna call you if you took it seriously back when you knew them. So when, they, you know, they're not calling you when you couldn't even play for one lesson in college, you know what I mean? Or whatever it may be, they're not gonna call you. But if somebody who became very famous calls you to go do this big concert, guess what you just got? Exposure. So now you've been exposed in a venue or place that you may never have gotten on your own, but this person brought you on and then guess what? Now you're on the map. Now everybody wants to know you. And this goes, you know, both ways. And I think that, um, so it was funny when I was looking at some of the Curtis pianists who I think do think more of themselves as soloists were just like, she might have a point. <laughs> like maybe, so I'm planting seeds to say, hey, be well-rounded. It's a good thing and it's going to help you. <laughs> well, and like to that point and, you know, just kind of mirroring your own journey it's just like be versatile have a lot of experiences like be you know you don't have to be able to do everything but at least know about it and like you said it's not just fostering those relationships so you know down the road someone can give you a call being like hey i had a good experience let's, let's have another one but it's you know continuing what you have kind of demonstrated with like the different programs that you're kind of the mentorship and everything it's the network helping each other and saying like, let me bring you along. Like, I think sometimes we get so stuck in a soloistic way of thinking sometimes where it's like, well, my success is my success. And it's like, well, you know, there were a lot of other people around you at the time, but also you can be that person who helps, you can help another person. Let's just put it that way. And so, yeah, it, it works both ways exactly. And I mean, like you said, let's face it, if we didn't have a good experience back in college, this probably wouldn't have happened <laughs> in, in both directions, in both directions. Like I, right, I exactly. <laughs> you wow. said what? Be on, your, be on what show? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this isn't from the top. Why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> I can't with you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, I'm, and you know what? This is a perfect segue. Let, let's give ourselves just a tiny little reprieve. We um, we have another clip of your playing. It's it's another solo play, and only because you and I talked about this, Michelle. There is evidence of our collaboration, not only from my own recording of of my recital that I I think I'm the only one in possession of, as well as my mother. But um, <laughs> but we we performed at our own graduation together, and it's out there. Go look for it if you want. It wasn't my best singing, but she sounded amazing. But we're not playing that. Actually, um, Richard, we, um, your, your mom wasn't provided us with... best singing is amazing, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard, your mom actually provided us with that clip, so I've got it queued up here. <laughs> no, but but seriously, this is like doing the connection from From the Top. You played on From the Top when you were of age to be on it, and you've actually been back on several occasions as a collaborator as well as a, as a co-host. So this kind of show thing is like, you're you know how it goes. But um, could you set up, this is uh, the Florence Price Sonata, could you set up just a, a little info about it? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, a little info, because I love Florence Price. I could, this could take up the whole show. So We can talk about her on the other side. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll wait on it. But yes, what you're, what, what you're about to hear um, is just absolutely one of my favorite pieces to play currently. I think it's just 
gorgeous. But um, Florence Price, absolutely amazing genius composer from 1920s, 30s, around that time. She wrote this sonata for piano in the 30s. And um, it actually won a big award for a competition that she put it towards. So um, this is the second movement of her sonata for piano. And it's reminiscent very much of the style of music uh, spirituals. So I'll say it that way because there's a lot of spirituals and often, of course, there's words to them. In this case, it's not based on any specific spiritual that you may know, although it might remind you of many, but it literally could have words. It's, it's totally sung. And to the extent that when I learned it, I put words to it myself because I wanted to really embody it. And, um, and now I can't play it without singing along with it. Um, so just enjoy. This is just a wonderful piece.
Mm. I believe the word transcendental. I mean, fantastic. I mean, Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm fascinated by just the the masterful blend of influences. I don't know if that's right, but I mean, I hear the chromaticism of Scriab and I hear um, lyricism, bel canto, you know, what can you tell me? What did you tell me from a pianist perspective? Because I can't wait to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, that's good. Um, no, I, I love how you're describing it. I think you are describing it very well. Um, that she was basically, I felt that this is what she embodied in a lot of her writing, which is this kaleidoscope of different influences. Um, there is always this well, first I'll say American sound, folks, you know, actually spirituals are also, you know, in a way folk songs, right? So they fall into the same category. So, you know, there's a lot of folk music in her, you know, in, in her writing. And then also there's this very romantic, um, from this romantic era, and you, like you said, Scriabin, well, it's a little later, but then also you have, um, I felt that right at the, I think, second section, it reminds me of Chopin, yes. and sometimes Schumann. And, you know, so I, I hear so many of these um, Brahms even in different times. They're, these composers that I know that she were in her ears and inspired her writing in, in a very romantic style. But then you get this um, spiritual song, you know, which is coming from the African-American um, you know, influence, and she'll use a lot, not in this movement, but a lot of dances that were specifically from the African American culture at the time. And, you know, so she was always pulling from, I think, every aspect of who she felt she was, you know, as a black woman who loved the music of her people, as a uh, classical pianist and composer who had studied these, you know, great romantic composers. And um, and then as an American, simply, you know, being um, aware of the music that was happening around that time, Gershwin is one to say, um, but many others. So I just feel like she does an amazing job in everything I've heard of hers, of mixing these blends of who she is and, and what she's connected to into her music and it's very unique she doesn't do it the way others compose because other composers do this where they're mixing a little bit of maybe some jazz or you know um folk songs into a classical style um i think for her it's just in a lot of ways i feel like it should be called its own thing because she doesn't do it the way anybody else does it it's so seamless <laughs> yes well, and you've gotten to know Florence Price very well, like not just because of, but like even lately, because um, if I'm correct, I know it's been rescheduled, but you were slated to perform her concerto, correct? Um, oh, many different times <laughs> <laughs> um, that I've had the opportunity to play with a um, number of orchestras with, uh, with this wonderful piece. Um, one thing I recently did was with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, and I actually recorded in January the Florence Price with them, and it's going to be broadcasted digi digitally on the February 18th. So very soon it'll be available to the public for all to hear. And please tune into the Philadelphia Orchestra if you want to hear me playing with them on the Florence Price Concerto. Speaking so it is not just the 18th, I think they play it for like almost a week. Or something after the date it's premiered so um and just and speaking of that concerto um a friend of mine dell um just wanted me to let you know how much he loved your florence price concerto in knoxville oh in um, knoxville said, oh well you know what that's awesome i noticed that garrett um mcqueen was also saying that he might tune in i don't know if he he's, did he's, but, he's um, listening he said um um I, I heard the tea story. Wow. Oh. <laughs> uh, Gar Garrett's on, on, on the Lead Society's advisory uh, board. Oh, so. Great. Great person to have. Yeah. So actually, Garrett was significant to me because when I came to Knoxville, Tennessee to play it with the symphony, I did an interview with him on the radio when he was still there. And I think it's one of 
the best interviews I've just ever had, especially concerning just the way we talked about well, Florence pre Price. Present company excluded. Of course, yeah, exactly. No, of course. <laughs> Yeah. This isn't an interview. This is a this is a chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Right, that's different. Very good. So, um, but it was very memorable, and it was a great experience. And we really went pretty deep into, uh, you know, Florence Price and uh, issues around her life and how it relates to now. So it was fun. So actually, that's cool, Abe, that you mentioned this friend of yours from Knoxville. So clearly, um, some great Knoxville connections here. I like that. <laughs> yes. So I'm. Um, where we have like a couple minutes left. What sure. is on the horizon for you? Like not even just like what is actually planned, but like what is it something you want to accomplish? Like either with your new position at Curtis or new repertoire that you want to get out there to have people hear anything that you've recently fallen in love with? Like, uh, well, um, I will say that, I mean, I already mentioned a project sort of within Curtis beyond just as a teaching faculty member, I want to, well, I guess basically teach some of these Curtis pianists how to teach, you know, I think it's very important. That's an aspect of, uh, especially a pianist live life that is always there. You know, there's very few pianists I know that don't um, teach in some capacity or um, end up doing that. So to me, it's a big deal. And especially in connecting with the kids in Philly, specific kids and giving them this opportunity. So I'm excited about that. Um, when it comes to my uh, performance career and things like that, um, I think it's just starting to be uh, possible to conceive of what may happen in the future. I think people are very tentatively making dates for concerts in the summer or such things um, that we're all very hopeful will be able to happen. Um, and so I think there was just such a hiatus or there was so much time where I just uh, kind of shut off my head on, you know, what could happen. And I, I just feel like I'm waking up again to the possibilities, but, you know, but um, I am looking to, um, again, speaking a little bit of Florence Price, but a little beyond that. One thing that I don't have is. I don't have any albums, you know, I have things on YouTube, but I, I don't have any professional albums that I've ever done. And I've been thinking for a while about what I would want that first one to look like. And I know that I want it to basically embody lost voices. And so Florence Price would be a big part of that, but others who maybe people do know them, but they don't know them well enough. I mean, I just feel like it would be such an inspiring first album. So I'm figuring out what that might include. Um, I'm also just on track as I try to figure out what that might include. I'm also just looking for as much music as I can find. Florence Price wasn't the only one, right? Mm -hmm. She wasn't the only black female composer or even male who um, wrote some amazing music that nobody bothered to publish or, you know, make a big deal out of. Um, and so I think she was an inspiration for me, but it's just something that is very exciting to me. It's like finding music that's very old, but now it's new to me, it's new to the world. And it's just, there's so much responsibility in that, you know? So um, it's, it's something that I think I'm gonna continue to try to do. And again, um, I, don't, the hardest part about doing a professional album is the money to do it. So mm -hmm. I'm figuring out that as well. Um, and, you know, so if you would maybe, you know, pay me for accompanying you for the scene, oh. things like that, you know, <laughs> you yeah. help me on this journey, but it's okay. It's fine. I understand. I'll, I'll set up your GoFundMe. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I see how you deflected that. No, I'm kidding. No, <laughs> Michelle, all these projects, I mean, they're incredible. And any, if anyone can do them, you can. I think if we were, but especially if we were, um, you know, if you ever take the show on the road, and I know Michelle's performed internationally when she's in London, you know, she she definitely can. Well, you say can, <laughs> I say con. <laughs> Oh, that's my only one. Okay. Um, leave meeting. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you for watching. How much was that? Five? Oh, you did four. You get one more. I'll give you one more. Okay. Well, let it get it out of your. 
I'll come up with it in a second. Now, listen, this is the we're at the end of our time. This is our time of our show where we give shout outs to to the world. So so to whoever you like, teachers, performers, friends, um, loved ones, uh, give me one second to play the theme music. And here we go. Shout outs. I'm going to do the first shout out. out. Yeah, no, this is the, this is going to be a shout out to Michelle's parents who are in the next room. But just, like, I, I can't thank you enough for having this wonderful woman in the world and that well, she and I have been able to work together. And here we are, you know, so many years later. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, man, who am I going to shout out to? I would say to my to my students, which is, yeah, kind of random, but um, to my students who have been awesome, my private students over COVID in a year that was hard to be inspired. And they all have worked very hard and improved more than any other year. It's very interesting. So, well, <laughs> so it- yes, I'm very proud of them. So shout out to them. And then also to my parents, of course, and loved ones that are awesome and came down to Miami to hang out with me right now so thank you (laughs) well um thank you so much for your your contribution to the world we need more representation um and you're doing it and you're creating a a whole new you're creating generations of, of of new pianists and music lovers and um I just I know you can do it can con that's God all damn it i can't remember We're I, done. okay <laughs> folks that's that all was number five <laughs> i wish it was better thank you so much for tuning in everyone good night good night